Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on this for this webinar. Local governments are going to be able to expect from the new flavor. My name is Jessica Ritchie, and I'm part of the Regional Programs and Engagement Grants in the Ministry of Jobs, Trade, and Technology. I'm calling in today from Victoria on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. I'm going to be passing over this presentation to the project leads from the ride for ride hailing from the province. But first, I'm going to walk you through a couple of housekeeping things that you should know so that you're able to um, ensure that you're engaged with the presentation and can ask all the questions that you want to. So if you're not familiar with uh, GoToWebinar, there, right now you are muted and you won't have the option to unmute yourself to ask any questions, but you can use the question pane, ask a question anytime through the presentation, and we will be having a question and answer period at, at the end of the session. So um, don't wait till the end, ask them anytime they come up, and we'll be keeping a log of them to make sure that they're asked. If we're not able to get to all the questions, I'll be sending them off to um, the ride hailing team so that they can be answered after the session. If you're having any difficulty with audio, um, please uh, try um, reconnecting or connecting or use the phone call option. Just click on the radio button for the phone call. Um, it'll pop up with a phone number as well as a passcode and you can try connecting that way. Um, and last but not least, this session is being recorded. So if you want to come back or share this information with anyone else, it'll be posted in about a week on our website, so gov.bc.ca backslash economic development, and you can look under the BC Ideas Exchange section. Um, so that's all that really is coming from me. So I'm going to pass it over to our panelists um, with uh, the, so the ride hailing leads from the Ministry of Transportation. Great. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for everybody that was take some time for being in attendance today. My name is Steve Haywood. I'm with the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure and I'm focused on the file of taxi modernization and ride hailing. Joining me today are Lynn Tang from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Community Policy and Legislation. As well, we have Michelle Yagi-Smith, who is the Registrar and Executive Director of the Passenger Transportation Branch. And finally, we have Jeremy Wood, who's Senior Legislative Director with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. We're offering up this web session today to speak to changes within the passenger directed vehicle industry in BC, specifically regarding taxis, limos, and soon-to-be ride hail operators, and what those changes mean to local government. Uh, next slide, please. So first off, I'd like to uh, provide a bit of an agenda, uh, what we're gonna be looking at. First, we're gonna provide some context on, on, on the work that was done. Then we're gonna discuss the changes that were made have a discussion on municipal working groups, and then look to some future work. And finally, we'll finish with some questions and comments at the end, as Jessica uh, stated earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so let's set the stage first a little with some context. Uh, the Select Standing Committee on Crown Corporations is a committee that was appointed to look into the introduction of ride hailing services in BC and to make some recommendations. Parliamentary committees are appointed by the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia to undertake business on behalf of the Assembly itself. Committees are comprised of small group of private members who have been appointed by the Legislative Assembly, and the committees derive their powers from the House and must report their findings back to the House within their allotted time. In regards to the ride hail file, the Crown Corporations Committee has examined it twice, soliciting a wide array of consultation from government, industry, and experts, releasing two reports, one in February of 2018 and another in March in 2019. The recent March 2019 report provided 13 recommendations for government to consider as it related to fleet supply, boundaries for operation, fares that are charged to customers, and aspects of safety in the industry. Uh, next slide, please. And I, actually, I think, Jessica, we have a, um, a poll question. So just a quick poll, if I can ask the folks on the line, if you wouldn't mind just uh, filling in one of the boxes uh, on who you're calling on in on behalf of today. So 
So it looks like we've had about 85% of people respond. So I'm just going to post the poll and share the results with you. All right. Well, that's very appropriate then, our, our session here with the, the amount of local government that's on the line. All right. So just furthering with the uh, context, uh, Dr. Dan Hera played a large role in setting the context for change with his report on modernizing taxi regulations. The intent of the report was to focus measures for modernizing the taxi service in BC in the context of challenges posed by alternative services, i.e. ride hailing. After extensive consultation, Dr. Hera made suggestions and considerations that could be applied to the passenger-directed vehicle industry, much of which was used in the legislative and regulatory development we will discuss later on, as well as policies undertaken by the Independent Passenger Transportation Board. Uh, this included a one-time increase of taxi supply by up to 15%, uh, that app-hailed trips could reduce rates in off-peak hours and have the ability to, for separate day and night shift vehicles. Next slide, please. When speaking of the acts and regulations, government held extensive consultation sessions leading up to the legislation and eventually the depositing of the regulations. Uh, there was a focus on local government working groups with staff at uh, Union of BC Municipalities, the cities of Van Vancouver, Victoria, Surrey, Richmond, Kelowna, Prince George, and Fort St. John. We also consulted extensively with taxi associations and ride hail companies to see how the proposed regime fit them. We held informative conversations with the BC Association of Chiefs of Police, BC's Information and Privacy Commissioner, and the BC Civil Liberties Association, and we focused on accessibility in our work and met with representatives of disability groups, seniors groups, and injury groups. We also included conversations, as is up on the screen here, with BC Transit, TransLink, and the Vancouver Airport. Next slide, please. All of the discussions presented today had a foundation that kept government focused on the work at hand. Uh, safety of passengers and drivers was very much at the forefront. And we were looking to develop regulations that reduced risk and promoted passenger-directed vehicles as safe transportation services. The protection of accessibility services with a focus on improving accessible needs transport in the future was a very large focus. Uh, consistency and fairness, and how, how could we ensure that the rules were the same or similar for all passenger-directed vehicles and their drivers, regardless of where they operated in the province. We looked to reduce regulatory overlap and burden that occurred between provincial regulations and local government bylaws or requirements. And we focused the future work towards data-driven decisions. Next slide, please. Okay, so with some of that context now provided, we wanna work move into the work that was accomplished. Bill 55, the Passenger Transportation Amendment Act, received royal assent on November 28 of 2018. Over the course of the six months uh, after that, government worked on the consultations, setting policy, making treasury board submissions, and working with our legal drafters. And that got us to the depositing of the regulations on July 8th of this year, which took effect a few weeks ago on September 16th. Prospective ride hail companies were able to begin applying to the Independent Passenger Transportation Board on September 3rd, and we'll talk about those applications later on in the presentation, but there is an expectation that pending any legal challenges, there is ride hailing operating in BC this year. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide, there's a lot of information on here, but this slide just provides an overview of the changes we'll be discussing in more detail on the coming slides. So working from the left to right, and green is where changes were made, orange is the status quo. Uh, looking at the provincial framework, has changed to incorporate safety requirements related to driver licensing, criminal record checks, and training. We also uh, looked into vehicle inspections and other driver and vehicle requirements. Government has introduced a per trip fee to support accessibility, as well as amending regulations to allow for variation in the design of accessible vehicles. And we are also incorporating data requirements to support compliance and enforcement. In the middle of the chart is the role of the Independent Passenger Transportation Board. The board's role was strengthened as the sole decision maker on passenger directed vehicles in the province and will also benefit from specified data requirements, allowing for data driven decisions to be made in the future. And the right portion of the chart addresses local government. Local government still retains the opportunities to issue business licenses and regulate streets and traffic through bylaws associated to curbside management and more. However, they no longer determine where passenger directed vehicles can operate and will no longer be issuing municipal chauffeur permits to drivers of taxis 
limos and eventually ride hail operators. And next slide, please. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Lynn Tang from Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Steve, for setting out the context for what's to come with the new ride hail taxi modernization framework. Uh, later on, Jeremy will speak more about the new framework um, and what changes you can expect. But first, I'll walk you through what's not changing for local governments. Um, as Steve mentioned, local governments will retain their authority to issue business licenses, which includes the ability to issue to set business license requirements in order to meet their community's needs. So as they continue to exercise their authority over passenger-directed vehicles, passenger-directed vehicles, um, as a, as a sideline I wanted to mention, refers to taxis, limousines, and ride-hail vehicles. So it's an all-encompassing um, term that covers those three types of vehicles, by the way. Um, so municipalities can continue to require taxi services to have business licenses if they already do so. And while there is not a requirement to, for local governments to require ride-hailing companies to have business licenses as well, as it is optional as an enabling authority under Bill 55, they can do so if they wish to. You will recall that one of the key principles behind the legislation is to reduce the regulatory overlap between provincial and municipal authority over passenger-directed vehicles. Therefore, the Passenger Transportation Board under Bill 55 um, has exclusive authority to regulate with respect to operating area and the supply of vehicles. This means that municipalities can no longer, in the exercise of their business licensing authority, regulate the number of taxi, taxis or ride-hailing vehicles or prohibit otherwise authorized vehicles from operating. Through past and ongoing provincial consultations with various stakeholders, we've identified a few key considerations that many stakeholders are looking for with respect to the taxi and taxi modernization and new ride hill framework. First, many, many stakeholders are looking for a fair and level playing field between existing industry and new entrants. They're also looking at making efforts towards reducing administrative burdens where possible on both service providers and municipalities. And finally, they are interested in facilitating the entrance of ride hail services for their respective communities. To streamline and reduce duplication across the regions, we've been working with regional working groups to discuss the possibility of expanding existing inter-community business licenses to include passenger-directed vehicles, such as taxis and ride hail vehicles. For those who are not familiar with inter-community business licenses, they enable businesses located within one participating community to purchase an inter-community business license in addition to their basic business license from their municipality, which allows them to operate in other participating communities. In these working groups, we've also discussed other ways in which to reduce duplication and improve consistency, such as discussing the pros and cons of licensing ride hail companies rather than specific drivers. Another area which is not changing for a municipal authority is with respect to business license requirements. So municipalities retain their authority to set business licenses, and what we mean by that are vehicle types and other standards to meet their local community needs. Um, Eco-friendliness and vehicle age are, are two examples of which. Um, under provincial regulations, 10 years and one month is the maximum age of vehicles allowed to operate under ride hail authorization. Additionally, the registrar has delegated authority under the Passenger Transportation Act to establish vehicle identifiers also known as trade dress for the ride hail industry. Vehicle identifiers are, are known as stickers, decals, tags, certificates, or some other identifier that must be displayed on each ride hail vehicle while it is operating under the ride hail company's license. The Passenger Transportation Board is, is in the process of consulting with stakeholders, including local governments, regarding some draft requirements. So long as municipal requirements are consistent with their authorities under local government legislation, such as the Community Charter, and do not conflict with the Passenger Transportation Act, municipalities can establish additional requirements for ride hail services. Once established by regulation, passenger-directed vehicles will be required to comply with the standards of the municipalities in which they operate. If a passenger-directed vehicle operates within multiple municipalities with differing standards, the passenger-directed vehicle will be required to comply with the highest standards. So, for instance, if one municipality requires vehicles to be eight years of age or less, 
and another requires vehicles to be 10 years of age, the vehicle will have to be less than eight years to operate in both municipalities. Finally, an area, another area which is not changing is municipalities will retain their authority to regulate traffic through street traffic bylaws and can address traffic and parking concerns through this authority. They may use this authority to decide how their streets are used in matters such as where taxi and ride hail vehicles can pick up or drop off passengers, where taxi and ride hail vehicles can park when they're in use and where they need to be parked when not in use. And also, they can decide which passenger-directed vehicles can use bus lanes. Municipal, municipalities will still be able to regulate in that way through municipal bylaws as long as they comply with existing local government legislation and other provincial legislation, such as the Motor Vehicle Act and the Passenger Transportation Act. So next, I'm going to introduce Jeremy, or ask Jeremy to walk us through what is changing. Great. Thanks, Lynn, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm uh, just actually, if you could go back to the last slide before um, uh, to the content. Yeah, what's changing? Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be talking about some specific changes flowing out of uh, Bill 55 and the regulations um, that apply to municipalities, municipal authority, um, as well as changes to strengthen the board's authority. Um, and uh, before I do that, though, I just want to provide a little bit of context for everybody on two very important entities within the legislative framework, um, just so everybody has a clear understanding of what the role of the board, the Passenger Transportation Board is, and what the role of the uh, Passenger Transportation Branch, specifically the Registrar under the Act, who heads the Passenger Transportation Branch. So I'll start with the board, and the board is an independent administrative tribunal. <coughs> excuse me, independent administrative tribunal whose members are appointed uh, by the Lieutenant Governor and Council or by Cabinet. And the role of the board is essentially to make decisions on individual license applications from companies seeking to operate uh, commercial passenger transportation services in the province, in the province. So that would be specifically taxi, limo, um, intercity bus, and now of course, as of September 3rd, uh, commercial ride hailing uh, companies that want to operate in one or more communities in BC. So that's the role of the board. The role of the passenger transportation branch and specifically the registrar under the act. Um, the branch is a uh, government entity within the Ministry of Transportation. As I said, it's headed by the registrar who is a public servant. Uh, and the registrar and the branch are uh, responsible for enforcement uh, of the act and regulations and auditing companies to ensure compliance with the act and regulations. Uh, and it's important to note too that the registrar also issues licenses under the act uh, for, those app, uh, for those companies or to those companies uh, whose applications the board has approved. Now, just to be clear though, the registrar and, and branch staff uh, within the Ministry of Transportation are not the only enforcement uh, entities that can enforce um, offenses under the act. Um, it's also uh, worth noting that commercial vehicle safety and enforcement within the Ministry of Transportation, otherwise known as CVSE, can also um, uh, enforce uh, offenses as uh, can police. So I just wanted to set out that, uh, set the table, if you will, in terms of the role of the board and the branch, because that's important for what I'm going to discuss here. If we could just go to the next slide, that would be great. So um, there's really two areas uh, here that I think will be of interest to approximately three, three quarters of our uh, listeners this morning um, from local governments uh, that flow out of Bill 55 and the regulations. And the first is the, um, the, the slew of new provincial requirements that are now uh, have been established since uh, September 16th, many of which replace what previously fell under the municipal chauffeur permit regimes in those municipalities that had municipal chauffeur permit bylaws in place. And I'll be talking a little bit more about those. Uh, but as well, um, a set of new, very important responsibilities for companies and drivers is being set out here under the new provincial requirements. And I'll be talking about those, but um, just as an example, to give you some context, uh, companies will need to make sure that their drivers comply with rec provincial record check 
uh, requirements. And I'll provide a little more detail about that a little uh, in a future slide. Uh, and as well, um, important changes uh, to provide the registrar with a new auditing power to audit companies for compliance and enforcement purposes, as well as increased penalties. And here, um, the uh, registrar um, uh, prior to September 16th had uh, the authority to issue an administrative fine uh, uh, to a maximum of $1,500. Uh, that, as of September 16th, increased to $50,000, so a substantial increase on the administrative fine, but as well, a, uh, set, of, a set of new offenses um, uh, uh, as well and new penalties uh, under the Act. And uh, Michelle Yagi-Smith, who's the Registrar at the Passenger Transportation Bench, will provide you a little more detail on those uh, later after I'm, I'm finished speaking. The second area of change is with respect to supply operating areas um, and uh, strengthening the jurisdiction of the Passenger Transportation Board. And, and Lynn um, hinted at this uh, during uh, her slides, and I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, uh, in some upcoming slides. So on to the next one, please. So we'll talk about the provincial requirements and uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive into municipal chauffeur permits. Uh, as of uh, September 16th, the uh, municipalities that had uh, municipal chauffeur permit bylaws in place could no longer issue uh, those permits in respect of drivers of passenger directed vehicles. So if they have a bylaw in place that apply to drivers of other types of vehicles outside of uh, uh, drivers of passenger directed vehicles, so here we're talking about taxis, limos, and and uh, in the not too distant future, commercial ride hill drivers. Um, but if there are other types of drivers, this change would not apply to those. It's only for the drivers of passenger directed vehicles. And um, provincial requirements are now established uh, to cover matters such as driver licensing, criminal record checks, driver record checks, and driver training. So key areas that um, had previously been dealt with by way of municipal chauffeur permits in those municipalities that had them established. Next slide, please. So in terms of those specific uh, requirements uh, that are replacing municipal chauffeur permits, uh, drivers must hold a commercial class of driver license. So I'm sure everyone is, uh, there was a great deal of discussion around this uh, leading up to the regulations that came into force on September the 16th. But drivers of taxis uh, and limos, of course, have always had to hold a commercial class of driver license, and that same rule is being extended to the commercial ride hail drivers. And what that means is, at a minimum, they have to hold a class four uh, driver license, but you can also hold a class one or class two. Uh, drivers must pass a criminal record check, and the provincial requirements set out that an, a driver must submit to an annual police information check with vulnerable sector screening. So that's the highest level of police record check uh, in the province. There are two levels. That's the higher one, higher standard. And um, in terms of the criminal record check, a driver is ineligible um, for in certain circumstances which are set out under the regulations. But essentially they are uh, if the driver has a pending charge for um, specific egregious offenses, um, or any criminal, any offense under the criminal code or the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, or if they have um, past convictions for specific egregious offenses um, or a uh, conviction within the last 10 years for an offense under the criminal code uh, or Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And as well, drivers must pass a driving uh, record check and the look back period on that is three years and uh, so one example um, in terms of the driving record check is that a driver cannot have four or more convictions for pointable offenses under the Motor Vehicle Act or they cannot have within the last three years um, they cannot have a driving prohibition on their driving record so something like an immediate roadside prohibition for example and uh, it's uh, the in the requirements uh, provincial requirements set out under regulation. It's very black and white in terms of what renders a driver eligible or ineligible, as the case may be. And that is really um, there because the companies are re now responsible for ensuring their drivers meet those uh, requirements. And uh, those companies will be audited to ensure that they're 
um, undertaking this new responsibility. And if a company determines that a driver is ineligible under these uh, record check requirements, uh, they need to inform in writing the driver uh, that they're ineligible. And the driver will have, within 30 days, an opportunity, if they so choose, uh, to appeal that decision to the registrar. And in doing so, um, the driver uh, needs to make a, the case that uh, whatever matter is on their whether it be their driving uh, history check or their police record check, is unrelated to uh, their duties in, um, of driving a vehicle for hire. And uh, the registrar then makes a determination and provides that determination in writing to both the company and to uh, the driver. And as well under the provincial requirements in the regulations, the registrar also has authority to require driver training. So the registrar could set uh, uh, driver training requirements for um, specific classes of um, drivers of passenger-directed vehicles. So here we're, we're talking taxi or limo drivers and or ride hail uh, drivers within a specific geographic area. Um, and this is important because um, uh, the availability of training, of course, varies um, across a province such as ours with uh, such a geographic uh, diversity and and uh, size of uh, uh, communities and uh, institutions available to deliver training. Okay, next slide, please. Great, and so um, now this is important to point out that though in those municipalities where um, municipal chauffeur regimes, regimes were in place, uh, any driver effective uh, September 16th uh, when the new provincial requirements came into force that was holding a valid municipal chauffeur permit, um, those drivers uh, could continue to drive on their municipal chauffeur permits until they expire or uh, September 16, 2021, so two years after the new provincial requirements came in, into place, whichever comes first. Uh, but effective September 16th, all companies had to issue um, what is called a record check certificate to their drivers. Uh, so taxi drivers, for example, need to have a record check certificate issued and it needs to be displayed uh, in a uh, place in the motor vehicle so it's viewable by passengers. And um, in the future, ride hail vehicles, uh, drivers of ride hail vehicles will need to, um, the companies will need to issue the same type of record check certificate. However, that um, can be displayed and made available by way of the app. Um, and as well, uh, of course, there are drivers uh, as of September 16th that were driving in municipalities that did not have a municipal chauffeur permit regime in place. And those drivers uh, do not need to comply and the companies will, don't need to ensure their drivers comply with the new provincial requirements until January 2nd, 2020. And that's just their uh, to provide some time for these drivers uh, or companies and their drivers to prepare uh, for the new provincial requirements. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and I've sort of hinted at this earlier, but uh, licensees or the companies have duties, of course, with respect to record checks. Um, as I've mentioned, they need to ensure that their drivers meet those prescribed requirements. They have to issue letters to those that they deem ineligible under the prescribed requirements. And as I uh, mentioned to those drivers would have 30 days then to apply to the registrar for a review if they're denied and deemed ineligible by the company they want to drive for. Uh, and uh, then if the, drive, if the companies deem a person eligible to drive, they have to issue a record check certificate to that uh, driver. And those record check certificates must meet the standards uh, specified uh, by the registrar. And um, so that could be things like the size of the record check certificate and or the quality of it, size of the font, placement of required information under the regulations um, that um, where those are placed on the certificate itself. Uh, and then finally, um, the companies have to maintain it, um, records related to the record check process under the new provincial requirements for, for a total period of six years. And that's there in place to support the auditing process that I mentioned earlier. All right, next slide, please. All right, another important uh, new provincial requirement uh, insofar as the commercial ride hail sector is concerned 
is the application of the National Safety Code. So taxis and limos currently, um, and this was prior to September 16th, uh, had to comply with National Safety Code requirements. And the same will apply here for the commercial ride hail sector going forward. And so there's an obligation in terms of the companies uh, to monitor their drivers and ensure that, um, you know, their drivers hold their requisite uh, driver license. Um, they need to monitor the hours of service uh, of drivers um, to ensure that those, those drivers are not driving more than they're allowed to under the regulations. Uh, they also need to make sure that uh, the vehicles are, are maintained and that vehicles have gone through uh, the um, commercial vehicle inspection process and that drivers have uh, evidence, the vehicle safety or inspection certificate um, on those vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. And in terms uh, of the inspection um, for these vehicles, uh, there was a change under the regulations effective September 16th. Um, previously, taxis and limos uh, were required to undergo an annual uh, vehicle inspection. And the changes effective September 16th actually um, were based on, or now in place, uh, based on a um, interval of 40,000 kilometers. So if a taxi, limo, or commercial ride hail vehicle in the previous year uh, had or was operated for less than 40,000 kilometers, then uh, the requirement for that vehicle would be an annual inspection. However, if the vehicle was operated in the previous year more than 40,000 kilometers, uh, then um, there would be a requirement for that vehicle to be inspected uh, every uh, six months. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and uh, now um, we're just going to talk about uh, uh, a little more deeply about the changes with respect to uh, strengthening the authority of the Passenger Transportation Board uh, in respect of setting the operating area and supply of vehicles. Um, and uh, so, as Lynn mentioned, municipalities, um, as a result of Bill 55 and the changes um, therein that were brought into force on September 16th, no longer have uh, authority with respect to determining operating areas um, of passenger directed vehicle or supply of vehicles. And uh, so there was amendments in Bill 55 to the Community Charter and the Local uh, Government Act, which essentially set out that a council must not regulate in relation to the number of passenger directed vehicles that may be operated under passenger directed vehicle authorizations or transportation network services authorizations. And a council must not also prohibit vehicles, here would be passenger directed vehicles, from operating in the municipality, including without limitation, uh, prohibiting the issuance of a license to a person to operate a vehicle um, for the sole reason that the person holds a license issued by another municipality to operate the vehicle. So those were uh, the changes essentially in Bill 55 with respect to municipal authority. And those changes um, left the board with the sole authority, um, as I said, to, to determine operating areas uh, and supply of vehicles. Now, I understand that we have a poll question uh, related to this slide. So if you could just bring that uh, Whole question up there and here it is that if you are employed in a municipality uh, will your municipality be making amendments to its bylaws related to ride hailing I'm just going to give this a few more seconds and then I'll share the results back with you. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Just head back to the presentation and on to the next slide, please. 
Yeah, I think we've already done this. Yeah, uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with respect to the role of the Passenger Transportation Board, um, as I mentioned at the outset um, uh, to this section of the presentation, it is the board that makes um, uh, determinations on applications from companies. And there's really three parts uh, to those determinations that the board considers. And these did not change uh, with Bill 55. And these three parts are uh, the board considers whether the applicant um, is a fit and proper person, uh, whether the application promotes sound economic conditions in the commercial passenger transportation industry in the province. And finally, that the app, in respect of the application, there is a public need uh, for the service. So those are the three um, uh, areas that the board considers um, with respect to an application. And uh, when the board receives applications, those are posted publicly. Uh, and so that any interested parties can make a submission um, on that application and uh, the board, uh, for the board's consideration as well. And fees are waived with respect to submissions uh, from municipalities. Okay, next slide, please. Now, this past August, last, uh, in August 2019, um, the board set out its policy in advance of the changes, the regulatory changes and, and Bill 55 uh, changes coming into force. Uh, the board's policies with respect to ride hail. Um, and there's really three areas um, here to uh, the board's policies. Um, one is that uh, instead of um, applying municipal boundaries uh, to commercial ride hailing, the board set out that there would be regional boundaries, and there would be five of them, and I'm going to talk about those in the next uh, slide. Uh, and as well, um, there would be no initial supply limits um, to uh, commercial ride healing. So that is, of course, um, in contrast to uh, vehicle fleet size caps that are put on place uh, right now um, and have been um, uh, for uh, since the this regime was put in place provincially back in 2004 uh, for taxis and limos and then as well um, the board set out that uh, there would be a minimum fare equal to the taxi flag rate uh, for commercial ride hailing as opposed to specific fares for time and distance and so therefore uh, from this uh, surge pricing would be permitted uh, in uh, peak periods uh, if the company so choose to, to operate a pricing model of that nature. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so here are the five regions that the board established uh, with its policy. So region one uh, covers the lower mainland uh, in Whistler. Um, and then region two uh, is the capital regional district, the municipalities uh, within that area, uh, region three, is the rest of Vancouver Island outside of the Capital Regional District, Region 4 being the Okanagan Kootenai Boundary Caribou areas. Uh, and then finally, Region 5 uh, is the North Central and um, other regions. Now, I understand we, we have a, uh, a poll question here related to this slide just to find out where uh, folks are dialing in from uh, with respect to these uh, five uh, regions here. So I'll just uh, give give you all um, um, a minute uh, or so to uh, respond to this question. All right, I'll close this one and I'll share the results as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, just over to the next slide here. Um, and I uh, just want to let everybody know uh, in terms of applications made to the board to date uh, since September 3rd, when companies, commercial, interested commercial ride hail companies could make 
applications to operate uh, somewhere in British Columbia. There have, have been, since September 3rd, 17 applications. Uh, and of those 17 applications, 12 have indicated that they would, they're seeking to operate in the lower mainland, Region 1 and, uh, area. Uh, nine of those 17 have indicated they would like to operate in Region 2, the Capital Regional District. Ten of those 17 have indicated Region 3 they'd like to operate in as well as Region 4, 10, 10 of those 17 have indicated they'd like to operate there. And then in Region 5, uh, five a total of five of the 17 applications have indicated they would like to uh, operate uh, in the uh, North, Central, and other regions um, of the province. So just to give indication that all, all five regions uh, have been covered in applications received to date that the board is currently uh, considering. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand over the remainder of the presentation in this section here on what's changing to Michelle Yagi Smith, who is the Registrar uh, of the Passenger Transportation Branch in the Ministry of Transportation. So, Michelle. Thank you, Jeremy. I'd like to thank participants on the webinar today for taking the time to listen in on the session. So, thank you. This section is going to look at data-driven decisions and increased evidence to support decision-making. While the branch and the board share an acronym, the Passenger Transportation Board and the Passenger Transportation Branch have separate distinct functions. The Passenger Transportation Board is an independent administrative tribunal appointed by government and there are six part-time members, including a chair. The board's primary responsibility is to make decisions on applications relating to authorizations for taxis, limousines, show vans, intercity bus authorizations, and transportation network services, or ride hail authorizations. The board has responsibility for determining supply, boundaries, and rates. And as previously mentioned, the Passenger Transportation Board applies a three-part test to assess if there's a public need, the applicant is fit and proper, and the application granted would promote sound economic conditions in the passenger transportation business. The board will use data collected from industry to determine their assessment for taxi and transportation network services authorizations. New data management system has been developed called the Data Warehouse. So the Data Warehouse will be a requirement for the transportation network services companies as well as taxi companies to implement their ride data during the day. And this information will assist in providing evidence for the board to support their decision making. They'll also be able to look at fleet size and congestion impasse. Next slide, please. Data collected from taxi and ride hail. So there's a number of new pieces of information that we're going to be collecting. And that's the category of trip, taxi ride hail limousine, driver shift information, driver license number, vehicle registration number, shift start time, shift end time. This is all the information that we'll be gathering and will be based into the new data warehouse. Trip type, the vehicle type used, hail type, Trip metrics, wait times, GPS coordinates, date and time, distance to pick up from hail location, trip duration, and trip distance. Compliance and enforcement monitoring will also be part of looking at this information. The new passenger transportation regulation requires more responsibility from licensees. Licensees are now required to obtain and issue record check certificates and a driving record for eligible employees. The licensees 
keep these records. They're not provided to the branch. Drivers must present both records where law enforcement requests. They must keep a copy in the vehicle or on their app. Companies have these records on file and per trip fees must be calculated and submitted by transportation network services licensees. Compliance and financial audits are a new component for the branch. An audit framework is being developed. It will be a regulatory compliance risk-based matrix so that resources are focused on higher risk areas. Data collected from taxi and ride hail. Ministry will be working with taxi and TNS sector to collect it. This unique data-driven approach will help the board in its decision-making on boundary, supply, and fares. This information that we see on the slide at this moment will be submitted at a minimum on a monthly basis. And larger taxi companies will be submitting their data on a daily basis due to volume. Next slide, please. The current focus is on implementation of the data warehouse and collection of data. It's a future goal to share the anonymized data with municipalities through a memorandum of understanding or information sharing agreement. And this data will aid in municipal transit and infrastructure planning. Municipalities will be able to regulate where transportation network services vehicles can stop and if drivers can use HOV lanes or not. Slide, please. Enforcement. Enhanced authority has been provided for investigations and audits. The passenger transportation enforcement officers increased from three in the past year to nine. There are now eight passenger transportation enforcement officers and one supervisor. Records will be reviewed by the BC Passenger and Transportation Branch and or Commercial Vehicle Safety and Enforcement. There's increased penalties under the Passenger Transportation Act. Company can receive up to an administrative penalty up to $50,000. Drivers can receive a daily fine of up to $5,000 per day of operation without a transportation network services license. These drivers are also subject to possible further sanctions, not disclosing the commercial use of their vehicles to lease and insurance providers. Companies operating as a transportation network services can receive a daily fine of up to $100,000 per day of operation with a transportation network services license. And finally, a company can also have its transportation license canceled. Currently, with uh, cooperation with Steve Haywood, who spoke to us earlier, lead of the Rye Hill Taxi Modernization Project, staff in our office the Passenger Transportation Enforcement Office officers have been working with a number of areas and organizations and municipalities to provide education sessions. They're working with law enforcement and other enforcement personnel to provide information on how to increase penalties and authorities for investigations is working. Next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Accessibility. Right now, the tax industry has only one option for people to enter and exit accessible vehicles, and that's by rear entry only. With this regulation, both rear and side entry accessible taxis and ride hail vehicles will be allowed to ensure the industry has a wider array of choices and flexibility in purchasing. This is so the accessibility community has access to more vehicle supply. Additionally, 
transportation network services operators will have an administrative cost of 30 cents per trip per trip license fee applied to non-accessible trips in Rye Hill. I'm going to turn this over now to my colleague Lynn, again from the Municipal Affairs and Housing Ministry. Thank you very much, Michelle, for Thank you very much, Michelle, for, rap for uh, clarifying some of the changes that are to follow. Um, during the development of Bill 55, during the development of a variety of stakeholders, including UBCM and various local governments, we recognized that after Bill 55 and its associated regulations came into effect that municipalities may have to update their bylaws policies or procedures to respond to the new framework and changes in local government authority. This led to the establishment of municipal working groups to leverage opportunities for a coordinated response to assist with the implementation for the framework of passenger directed vehicles. First, we establish a provincial working group to address pre and post implementation challenges. Some of the topics that this working group has discussed include business licensing issues, enforcement, data requirements, and vehicle identifiers. Due to feedback from this working group that many staff would benefit from learning more about this details, led to us arranging for this webinar to take place to which you have been invited. Other tools that have been developed, that will be developed um, with the input of this working group will be a regularly updated FAQ page on the Passenger Transportation Branch website, a one-pager regarding municipal authority, and a reference document comparing different requirements for taxis and ride hill vehicles that are in development. As you can see on the slide, membership of this provincial working group is quite diverse. It includes um, staff from Fort St. John, cities of Fort St. John, Surrey, Kamloops, Vancouver, Kelowna, Victoria, Prince George, Richmond, as well as TransLink and BC Transit staff. This working group will continue to meet as there remain issues such as data sharing, accessibility, and other implementation challenges that may need to be addressed with local government feedback. We've also established for regional working groups throughout the province, and those include uh, ministry, municipal staff from the Greater Victoria Region, the Okanagan Similkameen Region, and the Lower Mainland. These regional groups are meant to facilitate coordination and discussions, and the per membership of these two groups was purposely drawn from existing inter-community business license partnership groups. The three purposes of these working groups were, first, to share information between municipalities and the province regarding how implementation of ride hailing may look like in specific communities, and additionally, the province sharing its plans for data requirements and vehicle identifiers. Secondly, these regional groups serve as a forum for discussions regarding a regional response to the new framework in a manner which reduces duplication, improves consistency, and reduces administrative burden. And finally, we have discussed with these regional groups the possibility of expanding existing inter-community business license partnerships to include passenger-directed vehicles. These groups will also continue to meet on an ongoing basis as part of the province's commitment to reviewing how the system is working and to make any changes to deal with issues that emerge as ride hailing comes into force. This brings us to the next slide, which Steve will walk us through. Okay, thank you. And uh, as, as the slide states, there will be a special committee review. So everything we've discussed up to uh, on this presentation here today, we'll go through a review process that is legislated. Uh, when Bill 55, uh, the Passenger Transportation Amendment Act, received role, as said, this was an item that was straight into the legislation that a special committee would be enacted on or before, or would be appointed on or before January 1st, 2022, to review all aspects of the uh, taxi modernization and ride hail file, such as, and these are just some of the main points that are on this, on this slide here, but is not limited to this, the adequacy of supply of vehicles. So is there enough vehicles in, in the communities within the province? Uh, how has passenger and driver safety been handled with the Acton regulations? 
Uh, the effectiveness of the board's test that Jeremy went through in great detail, uh, the employment within the industry, including the uh, wages that are, are being paid, and then any impacts on public transportation, traffic congestion, and the environment. As we have seen, uh, you know, some issues with that across North America, and this is really where that special committee will come in and, and, and have a look at the work that's been done and then provide any recommendations that need to be uh, accomplished after that. Next slide, please. The slide that will be coming up next is, uh, there it is, there's some uh, passenger transportation branch contact information. The branch is uh, the lead portion of the Ministry of Government for any questions, comments, concerns related to taxis, limos, ride hail in the future, and, and everything we've talked about here today. So on the uh, slide, you have some contact information. Um, please note the telephone and, and email, those are the important areas. Lynn mentioned the Passenger Transportation Branch website uh, has some incredible material on there in our, in our frequently asked questions. We have some areas that are to assist companies and some areas that are specifically related to local government. And we didn't put that up on the slide here, but the easiest way to find the Passenger Transportation Branch website is through Google. Uh, like any of our government websites, it's generally much easier just to go through the, the search engine to get a, get a hold of it. Next slide, please. And with that, uh, Jessica, that concludes. I guess we can move into any questions and, and comments. Great. Thank you guys so much. We have had it 10 or 15 questions come in throughout the webinar, so I'm not sure we'll be able to get through them all. But if you guys are happy with that, I'll just ask the first question that came in. So some communities have indicated that they're not supportive of ride hailing and will not permit the use in their municipality. How are they able to do this when the regulation says there's no ability to prohibit ride hailing? Companies regulate their numbers. Yeah, so um, uh, there has been, uh, as you stated, some communities that state that they're not going to be um, permitting ride hailing. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have a legal ability to do that. The Passenger Transportation Act uh, is provincial right legislation regulating ride hailing. Uh, municipalities continue to have the ability to regulate businesses in their jurisdiction, including the ride hailing business. However, the regulations must be consistent with their authorities under the Community Charter, and those regulations must not conflict with the Passenger Transportation Act itself. So I think any communities that have uh, stated that, you know, will, you know, will be speaking with their, um, their legal advice and prior to, prior to likely following through on those, um, on those uh, items. Another question from, for, from municipalities that don't currently have a bylaw for chauffeuring. Will we need to create one to accommodate ride sharing companies that may want to operate in our, in our municipality? If so, do you have any template elements that we should include? Uh, yeah, I, I can take this one again. Uh, so, no, uh, what happened with the Act and Regulations is that municipalities do not need their or cannot issue chauffeur permits for taxis, limos, or ride hail operators as of September 16th. That now becomes a provincial requirement, and that's something Jeremy talked about a little earlier uh, around the record check certificates for criminal record and driver record uh, that are issued by the companies now as opposed to the municipalities. So uh, I guess that's a long way of saying no, you do not need to enact any, any regulations or any bylaws related to municipal chauffeur permits. Uh, unless you're looking at removing any existing, but I think the question was was more related to uh, municipalities that do, or local government that does not have any uh, rules currently in place. Another question that came in was, what will the PT board, will the PT board consult local governments in determining whether there's a need for the service? Is it possible to get a general list of those consultations? Yeah, so the Passenger Transportation Board uh, did, some, did some consultation over the summer with uh, taxi companies and ride hail companies in relation to their policies for ride hail that they published in August. Uh, since that point, uh, as of September 3rd, 
prospective ride hail companies were able to apply to the board for operations in BC. And what the process for the board is, is they post those applications publicly uh, for a, a short period of time on their site, on their website, for interested parties to make submissions on the applications, uh, whether um, in support or against what the application is, uh, is, is in regards to. So when it comes to the ride hail companies themselves, we've had uh, 17 applications come in. 16 of those applications have either already been posted on the site, board's website, or are in the process, uh, are currently in, um, uh, in process of posted. So they're, they're up to, uh, that are available for, for folks to make submissions on. When it comes to municipalities or, or local government, the board has waived their submission fee uh, for any submissions that are coming in on the ride hail applications. But I would, uh, I guess, recommend to the, the person who is asking the question to, to have a look at the Passenger Transportation Board website and go into their weekly bulletins. And that's where they publish the ride hail uh, applications themselves so that interested parties can make submissions. And um, another question just in terms of the companies that are applying. So is there a location or information available to which companies to make applications in a specific area? I'm looking specifically for Region 4. Uh, yeah, same thing on the Passenger Transportation Board website uh, through the weekly bulletins. And if you want, you can also email the branch and we can get that information um, on that website, on the uh, address that we had up a few slides ago uh, so that we can you know, assist you if you're unable to find the location for the Passenger Transportation Board and, and where they're publishing um, uh, the applications. And another kind of similar question, for those companies that are making the applications, do they have to operate in the entire region that they make the application for? Uh, the board itself, when they publish their um, the the approvals for applications, you know, will dictate the region, and we're not sure if they're going to dictate exactly the the operating areas within that region. It's not expected. I think that's going to be up to the companies themselves, depending on um, how they feel the market is, and and whether it's in their you know their business interest to be operating within every area of that region. The regions themselves are quite large. Uh, so it's hard to say. It's really going to be a business decision uh, mixed with the uh, approvals that the board places. Um, another came in. Can you give some examples of how the 30 cent fee that collected will be used to better support disabilities? Yeah, so we're, this is a great question. Um, this is an item that uh, when we uh, came forward with the acts and regulations, um, you know, it was a notional as to, uh, you know, how can this fee be used? And the reason it was notional is because we weren't entirely positive as to what the board's policies were going to be. Uh, we didn't know how many companies were going to apply to enter into BC, nor how many vehicles and drivers would be out there, uh, including how many trips would be there. So it was very difficult for us to uh, state from the beginning, uh, without knowing how much revenue was going to come in, how that revenue could be used. Now that we have been able to see what the board's policies are and the um, broad range of applicants for the ride hail industry, it's giving us a bit of a better idea. And we're just starting now to explore through consultation as to how those fees can be used to support accessibility. There's a number of different ideas out there, but we want to make sure that we um, you know, have those discussions with the accessibility groups, uh, with the uh, taxi and ride hail operators, and other interested stakeholders such as municipalities uh, so that we can make sure that that revenue is put to good use to supporting the accessibility community. Some of the ideas we've heard is, um, you know, perhaps um, offsetting some of the cost of the accessible vehicles. The, the vans themselves are quite expensive, not the vans, but the conversions, you know, to make it wheelchair accessible. Uh, perhaps the money can be used for training. Perhaps the money can be used for, um, you know, to offset the cost of the accessible trip itself. There's a lot of different ideas out there, but we've got to go through that process now, uh, from now over the winter, um, to, to really try to drill that down. And then as we start to see approvals come out from the board, and as we start to see operations uh, happen, we'll get a good sense of what that revenue is and, and the trends in the growth in that revenue to be able to apply that um, to, to support the accessible community. Great, thanks so much.
Another question that came in, given the significant regular regulatory requirements for ride hailing, there would will definitely be a lot of barriers for entry with small and rural communities. Many don't currently have taxi services. How can regulations be better structured to people ride hailing in small rural communities and in turn solve many of the economic and social challenges with this? I'm sorry, Jessica, I wasn't able to hear the whole question. You were cutting in and out a bit. I'm not sure if any other panelists heard the full question or able to answer. Sorry about that. It was a regulatory requirement to provide hailing. There's been barriers within small and rural communities, many of whom don't have taxi services. How can the regulations be better structured to en enable ride hailing in small rural communities? Yeah, it's another good question. And I think that's one that we're going to want to hear from the, the small and rural communities. Um, you know, the regulations themselves are uh, in line with a lot of other areas of North America, you know, when it comes to um, the, the criminal record checks, the driver record checks, the vehicle inspections, that is, uh, you know, some similar areas that are, um, like I said, across North America. Um, the class four license is fairly unique to BC and Alberta, as well as um, New York ha has a license class uh, designation. So that part is, is, is likely a little unique comparatively. And, and that's an area that I know that government has heard uh, is, is something that, you know, is wished upon to be, to be relooked at. But I think as this progresses, as applications are approved, as uh, rides are, are starting to happen within the province, that's where we're going to want to see where are the underserved markets and, and what can happen there, uh, whether it's ride hail, taxi or otherwise. And if I could just add to that, Steve, um, the special committee, which uh, you uh, highlighted in that portion of your presentation, I think is key here uh, because uh, services to rural and remote areas of the province is one of the key pillars of analysis um, in that uh, review. And um, so, as you see, their adequacy of supply, including small, rural, and remote communities, um, is, as I said, is a key pillar of that uh, review. Another question, has there been any indication as to whether TransLink or BC Transit will be utilizing the service of ride hailing companies? Uh, I, there has been some discussions, but I, I have not heard any indications uh, one way or the other whether that will be uh, formalized. I, I really don't want to speak on behalf of their agencies. I'm sorry. No, that's not a problem. Uh, a question that came in, why are winter tires or a requirement? Who would be determining that? Uh, so winter tires are required. Uh, based on signage uh, that's on the highways themselves, uh, unless there is any municipal uh, requirements for winter tires. I'm not sure if there's any, any local governments in the province that do have that requirement, but the Ministry of Transportation does require it uh, to be used, or winter tires or, um, or, or all-season tires to be used on uh, the majority of the mountain passes in the province, and that's uh, placed by highway signage. Uh, it's between October 1st and uh, April 1st, I believe, for the majority of the areas as to when the tires are required. Um, but that is something that is, you know, by, by highway signage. Sorry, just looking through the questions here. Um, what is the processing time to obtain a provincial chauffeur permit? So the processing time itself is really dependent on the uh, local police uh, station when it comes to the criminal record check, because what drivers will have to do, and so I live in Richmond myself, and if I wanted to be a ride hail operator, I would go into the Richmond RCMP, and I would ask for my criminal record check, and then I would provide that to the company that I wanted to work for. Uh, and then I would get my driver abstract and I would provide that to the company that I wanted to work for. And then the company needs to, uh, as Jeremy said a little earlier, needs to go through um, the, the requirements and, and determine if I'm eligible or not, depending on whether or not I have a criminal record or I have some issues in my driving record. And then they would issue the record check. Uh, or, you know, in this case, you know, speaking of the municipal chauffeur permit, the, the provincial requirement around that um, as issued by the company. So the real 
I, I guess the, the timelines there would be dependent on the availability uh, of the police force and the, the speed in which they're able to get the criminal record check from them. As well as, as if there's any issues with the criminal record check. You know, there is uh, processes for if you have a similar name or a birth date to somebody that has uh, some criminal issues, you may need to go through a secondary screening to make sure that you're not that person. Another question about processing times. Um, do you have a, do you know what the processing time will be for those 17 applicants that have already applied for ride The board has indicated that they are looking at a likely six to eight week window from when applications are received until when they'll be making decisions. So uh, we're expecting, based on that, if the board's able to meet that timeline, uh, and that timeline is dependent on how many submissions they, that, that they do get received, uh, but if they're able to meet the estimated timeline, uh, we, could see, uh, we could see applications being approved or denied uh, later this month and, and early into November. A question uh, along the lines of how things are going to work at airports. What's going to happen in terms of who can pick up and drop off at airports? So airports uh, have the independence to be able to make those decisions. Uh, I know that curbside um, curbside management at airports is a very big concern. It is a concern right now with uh, regular traffic and taxis, and I think it's a concern with the advent of ride hailing. But that's something that the airports themselves will be making determinations on and we have had some consultations with some of them already. If a driver is denied by one company, what measures are in place to ensure that the driver is not hired by another company? The provincial requirements are um, the same across the province for each company. So if a driver is deemed ineligible, and then let's say for because of a criminal record, uh, then that driver would also have to undergo the same process with the next company and the next company and the next company. Uh, the the checks and balances that are there are, are through the passenger transportation branch itself, along with CVSE and police during roadside stops. But through audits of these companies is where there will be the determination as to if they have put a driver on the road that um, should have been deemed ineligible, it will be caught during these audits. And And what is the makeup of the special committee? So the special committee is uh, to be appointed by the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia, and it will be made up of members of the legislature and be composed of um, all uh, parties. Um, so it will be an all-party committee of members of the Legislative Assembly. A question that came in concerning um, local governments are concerned about their responsibility to continually manually check the board's website to see if there's new applications in the municipality. Is there a way for local governments to be notified when they come in? Yeah, and I think if anybody does uh, want to get that extra level, um, they can send an email into the branch and. We've been through the working groups that um, Lynn talked about earlier, both the provincial working group and the three uh, local government or regional working groups. Uh, we've been sending it out to those groups when they have been coming in. But if you would like to be included on any of that, uh, please do send, send an email in and we'll make sure that we're capturing those emails and including them on any future uh, mail-outs um, that the board does do. They, sorry, they don't do the mail-outs, but they do post it. And when they have been posting it, we've been sending out a link to those postings. Another question has come in similar to for driver licensing. Uh, what measures are in place to prevent a driver from being licensed by multiple companies? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed part of that. What, what measures are in place for? To prevent drivers from being licensed with multiple companies. 
Oh, uh, there are no measures. There is uh, an ability for drivers to work for, for multiple companies, uh, just as there is that ability right now with drivers to work for multiple taxi companies or uh, limo companies or trucking companies. Uh, where there's, no, uh, there's no limit on that. However, there is uh, the requirement for maintaining hours of service uh, for every driver. That's a, that's a requirement, and that's something that we'll be looking to gather through the data warehouse that uh, Michelle talked about earlier. With some of that trip data, we will be associating trip data to a driver's license number. Uh, so through our audits, we'll be able to determine, you know, which drivers are working for multiple companies and then um, gathering their hours of service from that. Great. So we have had quite a number of questions come in. You've done a great job at answering those. Um, some questions were duplicate or had information, so I've tried to combine them. But if, if anyone feels now that they have a question that hasn't been answered or they don't want to follow up with that question via email, if you just pop to the question box now, and we'll just uh, keep these guys on the line for a couple, another couple of minutes just to make sure that everything gets answered. Uh, while people are thinking about those last uh, question came in, uh, can you comment on whether you're liaising with the Minister Simpson on the accessibility framework? Sorry, I cut out a bit again there. Liaising with the... With Minister Simpson on the accessibility framework from the from social development and poverty reduction? Yeah, so the intention from, from pretty much now and over the winter is to um, work with all of the different stakeholders related to accessible transportation. And that's, um, you know, what we intend to be doing is, is trying to focus with a, a broad range of, of consultations with, this, with the affected stakeholders as to where those per trip fees can be utilized. Are local police permitted to drop fees for the criminal record check? Are sorry, local police able to charge a fee for the criminal record check? Yes, most do charge a fee. Is is my understanding? Uh, I'm not sure, Jeremy, if you have any further information on this one. Sorry, really just cut out there. Um, could you just repeat the question? The question is, are local police permitted to charge a fee for the criminal record check? Oh, yeah, well, they do now. Um, so um, with a few variations, basically a vulnerable sector check or police information check uh, costs $75 at your local police agency. Another question, recently we received a consultation notice in regards to the vehicle identifiers. I've supplied feedback on this matter, however, have not received any notification as to whether the reviewing agency has received our comments. How will these comments be reviewed and what criteria is determined if the recommended be interested? Michelle, do you want to take that one? Absolutely. Jessica, can you repeat it again, please? Recently, we received a consultation notice in regards to the vehicle identifiers. I've supplied feedback to this matter. However, I have not received any notification as to whether the review committee has received our comments and how these comments will be reviewed and what criteria is used to determine if recommendations will be presented. So you're in and out, but I think... Um, so essentially, someone has submitted comments and they're not sure whether or not they've been received and how will comments be assessed? Is that the just question? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Jessica, you were uh, 
um, bringing it out there. So for those uh, on the um, participating in the webinar right now, uh, we have a consultation notice up on the PT branch website, and emails were sent out to um, all of the stakeholders to indicate that consultation was going up, and it is available for uh, five business days until next Tuesday, October 15th. And so, of course, all consultation uh, submissions are going to be reviewed and assessed. And there is a internal ministry working group committee that is also working with board staff and uh, members of staff from municipal affairs and housing, as well as our legal services branch from the ministry but in general. So all comments uh, will be assessed. And maybe if I, Michelle, if you don't mind, if I can just add on as well. Uh, when it comes to vehicle identifiers, uh, when it, in the ride hail industry, we're actually hoping that the vehicle identifiers or the intention for the vehicle identifiers is for law enforcement, whether it's uh, police or commercial vehicle safety or the passenger transportation branch or local bylaw. Uh, the vehicle identifiers are meant for enforcement to be, be able to identify a ride hail vehicle. When it comes to clients that have uh, hailed the vehicle on the app. We really want to get the message out to not look for vehicle identifiers, but look for the license plate of the vehicle and make sure that license plate matches the one that is on the app for the vehicle that was hailed. Uh, because what we've seen in other jurisdictions is, you know, where clients perhaps are getting into the vehicle thinking it's theirs because they've seen the, the decal on the window and, and they're getting in the wrong vehicle. And then we know when that happens that there's potential for uh, for bad things to come from that. So we're really trying to get the message out for, to clients. If you're going to be getting in a ride hail vehicle, make sure that you're getting in the one that the license plate matches on the app. Don't be looking for the trade dress. That trade dress is really for, um, like I said, for enforcement and officers to be able to identify. One final question, I hope you can hear me okay. Is there any consideration being given to sharing fees charged to companies with local police departments to cover increased enforcement? At this time, the Act and Regulations did not contemplate that. Uh, the, the Act allows for the fees to uh, be utilized um, by the Lieutenant Governor and Council. Uh, for the costs of the administration of of the work within government, as well as for the uh, to support accessibility, um, there was not any discussion to date that I'm aware of in regards to looking to get some of those fees back to uh, local police or or otherwise for enforcement. Okay, and sorry, one final question. Will there be an education campaign for individuals using ride hailing? Is there anything planned? Yes, we um, have been trying to promote the branch website as much as possible in regards to the current requirements. But as ride hailing does come out, you will see coming from the Ministry of Transportation uh, a number of media releases and, and, and whatnot to uh, make sure that everybody is aware of the requirements as well as some of the aspects of safety like I just was mentioning around the license plates you know making sure that you're getting in the right vehicle uh, those are items that we'll be looking to uh, come out with once once ride hail once the board has made decisions and we have an indication that the ride hail companies will be starting to operate we want to make sure that that is timely so we didn't want to put anything out early so that it's forgotten by the time um, the rides start happening but that is what we'll be seeing uh, likely in the coming month or two, depending on when the ride hail operations do start. And if I could just add to that too, we have set requirements for the information that the hail companies have to provide on their apps. So it is a fulsome list of the types of information like the vehicle, uh, color make, model, color, license plate number. So when an uh, individual who's hailing on their app have all that information, and so that information will be available on the app. And then as Steve has alluded to, we'll also have information on the website and it'll be media education in terms of 
um, for those um, citizens who haven't in other jurisdictions used Wayne Hale, so there'll be um, some information of how that information is conveyed. Fantastic. Thank you so much to our panel um, for both presenting the information that you had as, as well as answering all those questions. I'm just going to take control back here. Um, and just remind everyone that this webinar was recorded. So if you are wanting to view it or go back to the information, um, the webinar as well as the slide deck will be posted on our website, gov.bc.ca backslash economic development. Um, our panelists may also be sharing and posting it other places. So you may see it other places, but it certainly will be posted in the next week on our website. And because we did have so many people on the line from local governments, I wanted to highlight a webinar that's coming up on October 24th. We'll be joined by um, a number of individuals to speak about how you can create economic development opportunities with your local government legislation. So that'll include um, individuals from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, as well as you'll hear some success stories from the town of Gibsons and how they've been able to utilize that legislation. And I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to join this webinar. If you have any questions, obviously you've been given information for our panelists, but if you have any questions for our branch specifically, you can email us at economicdevelopment at gov.bc.ca. So uh, I'll uh, be following up with the panelists after this with just to share those questions that they had so they have everything marked or if anything else comes in. Um, if anyone has any questions, please reach out to our branch. And with that, I'm going to end our session. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.